Kawanang katulor ali sa dagat. Fangroy ang Kawanang katulor ali sa dagat. Fangroy ang Kawanang katulor ali sa dagat. Welcome to the 212th of the Cthulhu Podcasts. I'm Felbrick. Today we're starting off with the next part of Mr. Standfast, where there'll be a bit of a revelation. And then we'll have a musical number, and then back to the King in Yellow. Let's get started. Chapter 10. The Advantages of an Air Raid The train was abominably late. It was due at 8.27, but it was nearly 10 when we reached St Pancreas. I had resolved to go straight to my rooms in Westminster, buying on the way a cap and a waterproof to conceal my uniform should anyone be near my door on my arrival, and then I would ring up Blenkeron and tell him all of my adventures. I would breakfasted at the coffee stall, left my pack and rifle in the cloakroom, and walked out into the clear sunny morning. I was feeling very pleased with myself. Looking back on my madcap journey, I seemed to have had an amazing run of luck, and to be entitled to a little credit too. I told myself that persistence always pays, and that nobody is beaten until he is dead. All Blenkeron's instructions had been faithfully carried out. I had found Ivory's post office. I'd laid the lines of our own special communications with the enemy, and so far as I could see I had left no clue behind me. Ivory and Gresson took me for a well-meaning nincompoop. It was true that I had aroused a profound suspicion in the press of the Scottish police, but that mattered nothing for Cornelius Brand, the suspect, would presently disappear, and there was nothing against that rising soldier, Brigadier General Richard Hanney, who would soon be on his way to France. After all, this piece of service had not been so very unpleasant. I laughed when I remembered my grim forebodings in Gloucestershire. Boulevard had said it would be damnably risky in the long run, but here was the end, and I had never been in danger of anything worse than making a fool of myself. I remember that, as I made my way through Bloomsbury, I was not thinking so much of my triumphant report to Blenkeron as of my speedy return to the front. Soon I'd be back with my beloved brigade again. I had missed the Messines, and the first part of the third Ypres, but the battle was still going on, and I still had a chance of getting in. I might get a division, for there had been talk of that before I left. I knew the army commander thought a lot of me, but on the whole, I hoped I'd be left with my brigade. After all, I was an amateur soldier, and I wasn't certain of my powers with a bigger command. In Charing Cross Road I thought of Mary, and the brigade seemed suddenly less attractive. I hoped the war wouldn't last much longer, though with Russia heading straight for the devil I didn't know how it was going to stop very soon. I was determined to see Mary before I left, and I had a good excuse, for I'd taken my orders from her. The prospect entranced me, and I was mooning along in a happy dream when I collided violently with an agitated citizen. Then I realised that something very odd was happening. There was a dull sound, like the popping of corks of flat soda water bottles. There was a humming, too, from very far up in the skies. People in the street were either staring at the heavens or running wildly for shelter. A motor bus in front of me emptied its contents in a twinkling. A taxi pulled up with a jar and the driver and fare dived into a second-hand bookshop. It took me a moment or two to realise the meaning of it all, and I had scarcely done this when I got a very practical proof. A hundred yards away from me, a bomb fell on the street island, shivering every window pane in a wide radius, and sending splinters of stone flying about my head. I did what I'd done a hundred times before at the front, and dropped flat on my face. The man who says he doesn't mind being bombed or shelled is either a liar or a maniac. This London air raid seemed to me a singularly unpleasant business. I think it was the sight of the decent civilised life around one and the orderly streets, for what was perfectly natural in a rubble heap like Ypres or Arras seemed like an outrage here. I remember once being in billets in Flanders village, where I had Mayor's house and sat in a room upholstered in cut velvet, with wax flowers on the mantelpiece, and oil paintings of three generations on the walls. The Bosch took it into his head to shell that place with a long-range naval gun, and I simply loathed it. 
It was horrible to have dust and splinters blown into that snug, homely room. Whereas, if I'd been in a ruined barn, I wouldn't have given the thing two thoughts. In the same way, bombs dropping in central London seemed a grotesque indecency. I hated to see the plump citizens with wild eyes, and nursemaids with scared children, and miserable women scuttling like rabbits in a warren. The drone grew louder, and looking up, I could see the enemy planes flying in a beautiful formation, very leisurely, as it seemed, with all London at their mercy. Another bomb fell to the right, and presently bits of our own shrapnel were clattering viciously around me. I thought it about time to take cover, and ran shamelessly for the best place I could see, which was a tube station. Five minutes before, the street had been crowded. Now I left behind me a desert, dotted with one bus and three empty taxicabs. I found the tube entrance filled with excited humanity. One stout lady had fainted, and a nurse had become hysterical. But on the whole, people were behaving well. Oddly enough, they did not seem inclined to go down the stairs to the complete security of underground, but preferred rather to collect where they could still get a glimpse of the upper world, as if they were torn between the fear of their lives and interest in the spectacle. That crowd gave me a good deal of respect for my countrymen, but several were badly rattled, and one man, a little way off, whose back was turned, kept twitching his shoulders as if he had colic. I watched him curiously, and a movement of the crowd brought his face into profile, and then I gasped with amazement, for I saw that it was ivory. And yet it was not ivory. There were the familiar nondescript features, the blandness, the plumpness, but all, so to speak, in ruins. The man was in a blind funk. His features seemed to be disliming before my eyes. He was growing sharper, finer, in a way younger, a man without a grip on himself, a shapeless creature in the process of transformation. He was being reduced to his rudiments. Under the spell of panic, he was becoming a new man. And the crazy thing was that I knew the new man better than the old. My hands were jammed close to my sides by the crowd. I could scarcely turn my head, and it was not the occasion for one's neighbours to observe one's expression. If it had been, mine must have been a study. My mind was far away from air raids, back in the hot summer weather of 1914. I saw a row of villas perched on a headland above the sea. In the garden of one of them, two men were playing tennis, while I was crouching behind an adjacent bush. One of these was a plump young man who wore a coloured scarf round his waist and babbled of golf handicaps. I saw him again, in the villa dining room, wearing a dinner jacket and lisping a little. I sat opposite him, at the bridge. I beheld him collared by two of McGillivray's men, when his comrade had rushed for the thirty-nine steps that led to the sea. I saw, too, the sitting-room of my old flat in Portland Place, and heard little Scudder's quick, anxious voice talking about the three men he feared most on earth, one of whom who lisped in his speech. I thought that all three long, hard years ago under the turf. He was not looking my way, and I could devour his face in safety. There was no shadow of a doubt. I had always put him down as the most amazing actor on earth, for had he not played the part of the first sea lord and eluded that officer's daily colleagues? But he could do far more than any human actor, for he could take on a new personality, and with it a new appearance, and live steadily in that character, as if he'd been born in it. My mind was a blank, and I could only make blind gropings at conclusions. How had he escaped the death of a spy and a murderer? For I'd last seen him in the hands of justice. Of course, he had known me from the first day in Biggleswick. I thought to play with him, and he'd played most cunningly and damnably with me. In that sweating sardine tin of refugees, I shivered in the bitterness of my chagrin. And then I found his face turned to mine, and I knew that he recognised me. More, I knew that he knew that I had recognised him, not as Ivory, but as that other man. There came into his eyes a curious look of comprehension, which for a moment overtook his funk. I had sense enough to see that that put the final lid on it. There was still something doing if he believed that I was blind. But if he once thought that I knew the truth, he would be through our meshes and disappear like a fog. My first thought was to get at him and collar him and summon somebody and everybody to help me by denouncing him for what he was. 
and then I saw that that was impossible. I was a private soldier in a borrowed uniform, and he could easily turn the story against me. I must use surer weapons. I must get to Boulevard to McGillivray and set their big machine to work. Above all, I must get to Blenkeron. I started to squeeze out of that push, for air raids now seemed far too trivial to give a thought to. Moreover, the guns had stopped, but so like sheep is human nature that the crowd still hung together, and it took me a good fifteen minutes to edge my way to the open air. I found that the trouble was over, and that the street had resumed its usual appearance. Buses and taxis were running, and voluble knots of people were recounting their experiences. I started off for Blenkeron's bookshop as the nearest harbour of refuge. But in Piccadilly Circus I was stopped by a military policeman. He asked my name and battalion, and I gave him them, while his suspicious eye ran over my figure. I had no pack or rifle, and the crush in the tube station had not improved my appearance. I explained that I was going back to France that evening, and he asked for my warrant. I fancy my preoccupation made me nervous, and I lied badly. I said I'd left it in my kit in the house of my married sister, but I fumbled in giving the address. I could see that the fellow did not believe a word of it. Just then up came an APM. He was a pompous dugout, very splendid in his red tabs, and probably bucked up at having just been under fire. Anyhow, he was out to walk in the strict path of duty. Tomkins, he said, Tomkins, we've got some fellow of that name on our records. Bring him along, Wilson. But, sir, I said, I must, I simply must meet my friend. It's urgent business, and I assure you that I'm all right. If you don't believe me, I'll take a taxi and we'll go down to Scotland Yard and I'll stand by what they say. His brow grew dark with wrath. That infernal nonsense, is it? Scotland Yard? What the devil has Scotland Yard to do with it? You're an impostor. I can see it in your face. I'll have your depot rung up and we'll have you in jail in a couple of hours. I know a deserter when I see him. Bring him along, Wilson. You know what to do if he tries to bolt. I had a momentary thought of breaking away, but decided that the odds were much too against me. Fuming with impatience, I followed the APM to his office on the first floor in a side street. The precious minutes were slipping past. Ivory, now thoroughly worn, was making good his escape, and I, the sole repository of a deadly secret, was tramping in this absurd procession. The APM issued his orders. He gave instructions that my depot should be rung up, and he bade Wilson to remove me to what he called the guard room. He sat down at his desk and busied himself with a mass of buff dockets. In desperation I renewed my appeal. I implore you to telephone Mr. McGillivray at Scotland Yard. It's a matter of life and death, sir. You're taking a very big responsibility if you don't. I had hopelessly offended his brittle dignity. Any more of your insolence and I'll have you put in irons. I'll attend to you soon enough for your comfort. Now get out until I send for you. As I looked at his foolish, irritable face, I realised that I was fairly up against it. Short of assault and battery on everybody, I was bound to submit. I saluted respectfully and marched away. The hours I spent in that bare anteroom are like a nightmare in my recollection. A sergeant was busy at a desk with more buff dockets and an orderly waited on a stool by a telephone. I looked at my watch and observed that it was one o'clock. Soon the slamming of a door announced that the APM had gone to lunch. I tried conversation with the fat sergeant, but he very soon shut me up. So I sat hunched on a wooden form and chewed the cud of my vexation. I thought with bitterness of the satisfaction which had filled me in the morning. I had fancied myself the devil of a fine fellow, and I'd been no more than a montebank. The adventures of the past day seemed merely childish. I'd been telling lies and cutting capers over half of Britain thinking I was playing a deep game, and I'd only been behaving like a schoolboy. On such occasions a man is rarely just to himself, and the intensity of my self-abasement would have satisfied my worst enemy. It didn't console me that the futility of it all was not my blame. I was looking for excuses. It was the facts that cried out against me, and on the facts I'd been an idiotic failure. For, of course, Ivory had played with me, played with me since the first day at Biggleswick. He'd applauded my speeches and flattered me and advised me to go to the Clyde, laughing at me all the time. Gresson, too, had known, and now I saw it all. He'd tried to drown me between Colonsay and Mull. 
It was Gresson who had set the police on me in Mauvern. The bagman, Linklater, had been one of Gresson's creatures. The only meagre consolation was that the gang had thought me dangerous enough to attempt to murder me, and that they knew nothing about my doings in Skye. Of that I was positive. They had me marked down, but for several days I'd slipped clean out of their ken. As I went over the incidents, I asked if everything was yet lost. I had failed to hoodwink Ivory, but I had found out his post office, and if he only believed I hadn't recognised him for the miscreant of the black stone, he would go on in his old ways and play into Blenkeron's hands. Yes, but I had seen him in undress, so to speak, and he knew that I had seen him. The only thing now was to collar him before he left the country, for there was ample evidence to hang him on. The law must stretch out its long arm and collect him, and Gresson, and the Portuguese Jew, try them by court-martial and put them decently underground. But he had now more than an hour's warning, and I was entangled with red tape in this damned APM's office. The thought drove me frantic, and I got up and paced the floor. I saw the orderly with rather a scared face making ready to press the bell, and I noticed that the fat sergeant had gone to lunch. "'Say, mate,' I said, "'don't you feel inclined to do a poor fellow a good turn? I know I'm in for it all right, but I'll take my medicine like a lamb. But I want badly to put a telephone call through.' "'It ain't allowed,' was the answer. I'd get L from the old man. But he's gone out, I urged. I don't want you to do anything wrong, mate. I leave you to do the talking if you'll only send my message. I'm flush of money, and I don't mind handing you a quid for the job. He was a pinched little man, with a weak chin, and he obviously wavered. Who do you want to talk to? he asked. Scotland Yard, I said, the home of the police. Lord bless you, there can't be no harm in that. You've only got to ring up Scotland Yard. I'll give you the number, and give the message to Mr. McGillivray. He's the head bummer of all the bobbies. That sounds a bit of all right, he said. The old man, he won't be back for half an hour, nor the sergeant neither. Let's see you quit, though. I laid a pound note on the form beside me. It's yours, mate, if you get through to Scotland Yard and speak to the piece I'm going to give you. He went over to the instrument. What do you want to say to the bloke with the long name? Say that Richard Hanney is detained at the APM's office in Claxon Street. Say he's got important news. Say urgent and secret news. And ask Mr. McGillivray to do something about it at once. But Annie ain't the name you gave. Lord bless you, no. Did you never hear of a man borrowing another man's name? Anyhow, that's the one I want you to give. But if this Mac man comes round here, they'll know he's been rung up, and I'll have the old man down on me. It took ten minutes and a second-pound note to get him past this hurdle, and by and by he screwed up his courage and rang the number. I listened with some nervousness while he gave my message. He had to repeat it twice, and waited eagerly on the next words. "'No, sir,' I heard him say. "'He don't want you to come round here. He thinks as how I mean to say he wants—' I took a long stride and twitched the receiver from him. "'McGillivray,' I said. "'Is that you? It's Richard Hanney.' For the love of God, come round here this instant and deliver me from the clutches of a tomfool APM. I've got the most deadly news, and there's not a second to waste. For God's sake, come quick. And then I added, just tell your fellows to gather ivory at once. You know his lairs. I hung up the receiver, and faced a pale and indignant orderly. It's all right, I said. I promise you you won't get into trouble on my account. And there's your two quid. The door in the next room opened and shut. The APM had returned from lunch. Ten minutes later, the door opened, and I heard McGillivray's voice, and it was not pitched in dulcet tones. It run up against minor officialdom, and he was making hay with it. I was my own master once more, so I forsook the company of the orderly. I found a most rattled officer trying to save a few rags of his dignity, and the formidable figure of McGillivray instructing him in manners. "'Glad to see you, Dick,' he said. "'This is General Hannay, sir.' It may comfort you to know that your folly may have just been the difference between your country's victory and defeat. I shall have a word to say to your superiors. It was hardly fair. I had to put in a word for the old fellow, whose red tab seemed suddenly to have grown dingy. It was my blame, wearing this kit. We'll call it a misunderstanding and forget it. But I would suggest that civility is not wasted even on a poor devil of a defaulting private soldier. 
Once in McGillivray's car, I poured out my tale. "'Tell me it's a nightmare,' I cried. "'Tell me that the three men we collected on the rough were shot long ago.' Two, he replied. "'But one escaped. Heaven knows how he managed it, but he disappeared clean out of the world.' The plump one, who lisped in his speech, McGillivray nodded. "'Well, we're in it this time. Have you issued instructions?' "'Yes. With luck we shall have our hands on him within an hour.' We'll get our net round his horns. But two hours start, I said. It's a big handicap, for you're dealing with a genius. Yet I think we can manage it. Where are you bound for? I told him my rooms in Westminster, and then to my old flat in Park Lane. The day of disguises is past. In half an hour I'll be Richard Hannay. It'll be a comfort to get into uniform again, and then I'll look up Blenkeron. He grinned. I gather you've had a riotous time. We've had a good many anxious messages from the North about a certain Mr. Brand. I couldn't discourage our men, for I fancied it might have spoiled your game. I heard that last night they'd lost touch with you in Bradfield, so I rather expected to see you here today. Efficient body of men, the Scottish police. Especially when they have various enthusiastic amateur helpers. So, he said, yes, of course, they would have. But I hope presently to congratulate you on the success of your mission. I'll bet you a pony you don't. I said. I never bet on a professional subject. Why this pessimism? Only that I know our gentleman better than you. I've been twice up against him. He's the kind of wicked that don't cease from troubling until they're stone dead, and even then I'd want to see the body cremated, and take the ashes into mid-ocean and scatter them. I've got a feeling that he's the biggest thing you or I will ever tackle. And now it's time to get back to the King in Yellow, this is part five of The Street of Our Lady of the Fields. The month passed quickly for Hastings, and left few definitive impressions after it. It did leave some, however. One was a painful impression of meeting Mr. Bladden on the Boulevard de Capucines in company with a very pronounced young person whose laugh dismayed him, and when at last he escaped from the café where Mr. Bladden had hauled him in to join them in a bock, he felt as if the whole boulevard was looking at him and judging him by his company. Later, an instinctive conviction regarding the young person with Mr. Bladden sent the hot blood into his cheek, and he returned to the pension in such a miserable state of mind that Miss Bing was alarmed and advised him to conquer his homesickness at once. Another impression was equally vivid. One Saturday morning, feeling lonely, his wanderings about the city brought him to the Gare Saint Lazare. It was early for breakfast, but he entered the hotel terminus and took a table near the window. As he wheeled about to give his order, a man passing rapidly along the aisle collided with his head, and looking up to receive the expected apology, he was met instead by a slap on the shoulder and a hearty, What the deuce are you doing here, old man? It was Rowden, who seized him and told him to come along. So, mildly protesting, he was ushered into a private dining-room where Clifford, rather red, jumped up from the table and welcomed him with a startled air, which was softened by the unaffected glee of Rowden and the extreme courtesy of Elliot. The latter presented him to three bewitching girls, who welcomed him so charmingly and seconded Rowden in his demand that Hastings should make one of the party, that he consented at once. While Elliot briefly outlined the projected excursion to La Roche, Hastings delightedly ate his omelette, and returned the smiles of encouragement from Cecile, Colette, and Jacqueline. Meantime, Clifford, in a bland whisper, was telling Rowden what an ass he was. Poor Rowden looked miserable until Elliot, divining how affairs were turning, frowned on Clifford, and found a moment to let Rowden know that they were all going to make the best of it. "'You shut up,' he observed to Clifford. "'It's fate, and that settles it.' "'It's Rowden, and that settles it,' murmured Clifton, concealing a grin for, after all, he was not Hastings wetness. So it came about that the train which left the Gare St. Lazare at 9.15am stopped a moment in its career towards the Havre, and deposited at the Red Roof station of La Roche a merry party, armed with sunshades, trout rods, and one cane, carried by the non-combatant Hastings. Then, when they had established their camp in a grove of sycamores, which bordered the little river Ept, Clifford, the acknowledged master of all that pertained to sportsmanship, took command. "'You, Rowden,' he said, "'divide your flies, and Elliot keep an eye on him, or else he'll be tying to put on a float and a sinker. 
prevent him by force from grubbing about for worms. Elliot protested, but was forced to smile in the general laugh. You make ill of me, he asserted. Do you think this is my first trout? I shall be delighted to see your first trout, said Clifford, and dodging a fly-hook hurled with intent to hit, proceeded to sort and equip three slender rods destined to bring joy and fish to Cecile, Colette, and Jacqueline. With perfect gravity, he ornamented each line with four split shot, a small hook, and a brilliant quill float. I shall never touch the worms, announced Cecile with a shudder. Jacqueline and Colette hastened to sustain her, and Hastings pleasantly offered to act in the capacity of General Beta and take her off of fish. But Cecile, doubtless fascinated by the gaudy flies in Clifford's book, decided to accept lessons from him in the true art and presently disappeared up the ept with Clifford in tow. Elliot looked doubtfully at Colette. "'I prefer gudgeons,' said that damsel, with decision. "'And you, Monsieur Rowden, may go away when you please. May they not, Jacqueline?' "'Certainly,' responded Jacqueline. Elliot, undecided, examined his rod and reel. "'You've got your reel on wrong side up,' observed Rowden. Elliot wavered, and stole a glance at Colette. "'I—I I have almost decided to—' to not flip the flies about just now, he began. There's the pole that Cecile left. Don't call it a pole, corrected Rowden. Rod, then, continued Elliot, and started off in the wake of the two girls, but was promptly collared by Rowden. No, you don't. Fancy a man fishing with a float and a sinker when he has a fly rod in his hand. You come along. Where the placid little ebbed flows down between its thickets to the Seine, a grassy bank shadows the haunt of the gudgeon and on this bank sat Colette and Jacqueline, and chattered and laughed and watched the swerving of the scarlet quills while Hastings, his hat over his eyes, his head on a bank of moss, listened to their soft voices and gallantly unhooked the small and indignant gudgeon when a flash of rod and a half-suppressed scream announced a catch. The sunlight filtered through the leafy thickets, awaking to song the forest birds. Magpies in spotless black and white flirted above, alighting nearby with a hop and a bound and a twitch of the tail. Blue and white jays with rosy breasts shrieked through the trees, and a low sailing hawk wheeled amongst the fields of ripening wheat, putting to flight flocks of twittering hedge-birds. Across the Seine a gull dropped to the water like a plume. The air was pure and still. Scarcely a leaf moved. Sounds from a distant farm came faintly. The shrill cock-crow and dull baying and now and then a steam-tug with big raging smoke-pipe, bearing the name Guepe 27, ploughed up the river dragging its interminable train of barges, or a sailboat dropped down with the current towards the sleepy Rouen. A faint fresh odour of earth and water hung in the air, and through the sunlight orange-tipped butterflies danced above the marshy grass, soft velvety butterflies flapped through the mossy woods. Hastings was thinking of Valentine. It was two o'clock when Elliot strolled back, and frankly admitting that he had eluded Rowden, sat down beside Colette, and prepared to doze with satisfaction. "'Where are your trout?' said Colette severely. "'They still live,' murmured Elliot, and went fast asleep. Rowden returned shortly after, and casting a scornful glance at the slumbering one, displayed three crimson-flecked trout. "'And that,' smiled Hastings lazily, "'that is the holy end to which the faithful plod the slaughter of these three small fish with a bit of silk and a feather. Rowden disdained to answer him. Colette caught another gudgeon and awoke Elliot, who protested and gazed about for the lunch baskets as Clifford and Cecile came up demanding instant refreshment. Cecile's skirts were soaked, and her gloves torn, but she was happy, and Clifford, dragging out a two-pound trout, stood still to receive the applause of the company. "'Where the deuce did you get that?' demanded Elliot. Cecile, wet and enthusiastic, recounted the battle, and then Clifford eulogised her powers with the fly, and in proof produced from his creel a defunct chub, which, he observed, just missed being a trout. They were all very happy at luncheon, and Hastings was voted charming. He enjoyed it immensely, only it seemed to him at moments that flirtation went further in France than in Millbrook, Connecticut, and he thought that Cecile might be a little less enthusiastic about Clifford that perhaps it would be quite as well if Jacqueline sat further away from Rowden, and that possibly Colette could have, for a moment at least, 
taken her eyes from Elliot's face. Still, he enjoyed it, except when his thoughts drifted to Valentine, and then he felt that he was very, very far away from her. La Roche is at least an hour and a half from Paris. It is also true that he felt a happiness, a quick heartbeat, when at eight o'clock that night the train which bore them from La Roche rolled into Gare St. Lazare, and he was once more in the city of Valentine. Good night, they said, pressing around him. You must come with us next time. He promised, and watched them, two by two, drift into the darkening city, and stood so long that when again he raised his eyes the vast boulevard was twinkling with gas jets, through which the electric lights stared like moons. The King in Yellow continues next time. And that's all except to let you know that my latter-day Lovecraftian short story called Incursion is available to purchase at audible.com. Opening music was provided by Victor Valdez from The Symbol Project. This file is released on an attribution, non-commercial, and no derivatives license. So, until next time. CthulhuPodcast.co.uk